I'm Park Howell, and welcome to The Business of Story, where I consult, teach, coach, and speak on the applied science and bewitchery of brand and business storytelling, so that you can clarify your story to amplify your impact and simplify your life. I thought it was just a stupid picture of a pig in the ocean. But after hearing that story, I had to have it. Now I wasn't just buying a picture. I was buying a story. Story literally made the picture worth more money to me. That's what businesses are about. People buy brands. People buy stories much more than anything else. I work with a lot of big enterprise companies, but let's just say I always tell folks, drop the PowerPoint, close your laptops, start with your story. If you want people to get engaged and you want people to act, you have to tell them an emotionally powerful story. That's with great characters, it's with uncertain outcomes, and it's with high stakes and drama. All business strategy is a story. Welcome, folks, to another edition of the Business of Story. And today we're going to cover something that we really have yet to cover in 159 episodes, and that is the power of word of mouth marketing. And how do you make that happen in your world so that you get your customers sharing your brand story? Because as you probably know by now, that referral business is the absolute best, most powerful kind of customer attraction you can get. And I learned this a long, long time ago before I actually word of mouth marketing was a thing. And I'm talking like way back in the time machine of 1981. I was a senior in advertising at Washington State University. It was about to graduate, but I had a quarter's worth of internship to go. So I was a snot-nosed summer intern at this PR company called the Fury Group in Seattle. And it was great because one of the clients they put me on was to help promote the Seattle Symphony Golf Classic, raising money, funds for the symphony. And we were lucky that year in 81 because we had both Jack Nicklaus and Arnold Palmer coming to town. So they were the big attraction. So as you might imagine, in the PR world, we were doing the usual press releases and media junkets and that kind of thing. And to me, it was kind of boring. And I thought, well, we don't have any money for advertising, so how creative can we get with a press release? Not. So I had an idea, and I went to Mrs. John Fluke, who happened to be the co-chair for the event. But more importantly, she was the wife of John Fluke, who owned this enormous Fluke electronics company, which is still around today. And they happen to have like a hundred foot yacht. So I asked her if I could borrow her yacht. I had an idea for a promotional stunt for the golf classic. And now Pat Fury, who owned the firm, kind of rolled her eyes thinking, oh, look at this kid. You know, what does he think he's up to? And I think she admired my chutzpah, but would never get a yes out of that request. Although I will say Mrs. Fluke was intrigued. She said, so, well, what do you have in mind? I said, well, I think what we ought to do to gain some more traction for this Seattle Symphony Golf Classic is take your yacht, go travel the Evergreen Point Bridge on Tuesday afternoon at four o'clock. I'm going to dress seven buddies up in tuxedos. None of them can play, by the way, but we're going to give them instruments and we're going to put big old speakers on the front of them as if they're playing for the commute, you know, the crowd home heading across the Evergreen Point Bridge. And we will then string from the yard arms the Seattle Symphony Golf Classic this Saturday, Sahali Country Club, Jack Nicklaus and Arnold Palmer. And we'll just cruise up and down. We might snarl some traffic, but the idea is to get people talking about and build awareness For the classic. Well, she was all into it. I was surprised. She brought the boat around. We got on board. They even brought champagne and hors d'oeuvres for the cast and crew. I thought that was a nice touch. And as we were getting on the boat and loading all the equipment on, what did I do? I promptly put one of the big speakers right through a starboard window in their cabin, but she just shrugged it off because she was just having a blast with this caper. Anyways, we go out. We're out there for two hours. We're snarling traffic. The police show up. We thought maybe we might get arrested or they push us away, but they didn't, thank God. And as it turned out, we got all kinds of coverage. They sent in the traffic helicopters, shot footage of it. I even got this great little article in the the paper the next day about my little stunt for the golf class. So that was the very first time I'd ever done anything about word of mouth marketing. I was never taught it. It just occurred to me that that might be a fun little bit and it worked unbelievably well. Well, I can tell you our guests on today's show, we'd call that probably designing a talk trigger. 
here about how you can design these story starters to get people talking about your brand and sharing your brand. And I got to tell you, we have two of the best minds in the business for you today. Now, with us is the maestro of word of mouth marketing, Jay Bear. He's the founder of Convince and Convert, a New York Times bestselling author of six books and a newly inducted member of the National Speakers Association Hall of Fame. I mean, if you've ever seen Jay on stage, you know he's a walking talk tri trigger. Just check out his plaid wardrobe. It'll blow you away. But that's not all. On today's show, we also have Daniel Lemon, a leader in reputation management, digital marketing, and social media customer service. The two have co-authored their new book called Talk Triggers, the complete guide to creating customers with word of mouth marketing. Gentlemen, welcome to the business of story. Park, fantastic to be here. Thank you so much for having Daniel and I. It is always great to interact with you. Congratulations on all the success with the business of story. You are doing it right. And talk about word of mouth marketing. Everybody's talking about this show. Oh, and well, thank so. you for that. And folks, you may or may not know, but Jay helped me launch this back over three years ago now, if you can believe that. You were my very first guest in show number one, and now we're up to 159. So thanks for helping kick off the business of story platform. And we've been and having a blast ever since. And in that relationship with Jay and building, I got the extreme pleasure of meeting and working alongside Daniel Lemon. So Daniel, welcome to the show. Yep. Very much a privilege to be here. I've, I've seen the journey of business of story from its very beginning. So it's really, really exciting to see it come to life and that you reach, you're up to hundreds almost of episodes at this point, which is amazing. Oh, it's fun. And I appreciate that. Now I've known Jay a lot longer than I've known Daniel. And Jay, you've always been when you were living back here in Arizona and building your different companies and so forth, you always lean towards word of mouth marketing and doing things that really surprised people. And I think you were very much ahead of your time when you were doing that even back then. What was it about word of mouth marketing or why do you think that particular way to connect with customers really connected with you. Yeah, it's funny, Park, and thank you for those kind words. I didn't understand that's what I was doing until Daniel and I embarked on this journey. For me, it was more intuition. It was if you're going to do something and it is in some way the same thing that everybody else is doing, maybe, just maybe, you should endeavor to do that thing a little different. That if you play follow the leader, and, and we fall into this trap in business all the time, don't we? We say, well, who's the best at that in this category? And let's mimic or mock or model what we do after whoever is the quote unquote best. Well, when you do that, when you play follow the leader, you're never going to be anything other than second best. You're certainly not going to be distinctive. You're certainly not going to be memorable. And you're certainly not going to be talkable in the parlance of the book. And so I've always tried to sort of cut against the grain, whether it's having a little bit of a different kind of a car or a different kind of a business card or a different kind of a suit. I just feel like if you're going to do something, you might as well do something that has some storytelling sort of raw materials baked into it. But then when we started on this journey, Daniel helped me realize like, oh, well, what we've really done here is created a word of mouth strategy. And that's the weird part about this, right? So everybody listening right now cares about word of mouth and they should. It represents half of the US economy. Half of all purchases are driven at least in part by word of mouth. But yet nobody listening has an actual word of mouth strategy. You might have a marketing strategy, a digital marketing strategy, a social strategy, a PR strategy, a crisis strategy, an HR and recruiting strategy, maybe even because of this show, a storytelling strategy. But you don't have a word of mouth strategy. Nobody does. We just take it for granted. And that's what Daniel and I are trying to fix is to give people what they need to actually do word of mouth on purpose instead of on accident. Daniel, how do you guys define what word of mouth marketing is? Because we may, you know, we'll have listeners here saying, I'm not exactly clear on what they're talking about. Is this just doing stunts or what is it? How do you guys define it? You know, that's an interesting point. I mean, Jay and I actually debated this a lot at the beginning because what is word of mouth marketing? What is a talk trigger versus a gimmick or a stunt? And sort of the way we think about it, the case studies we looked at, the companies we looked at that seem to be really killing it with word of mouth. The way they approach it is strategic operational differentiators. So there's something they're doing in the delivery of their product or service, whether they're a physician or a hotel or a restaurant, there's something just a little bit different that becomes storytelling fodder. It becomes a, a thing that people can talk about. And because of that, people do. We've got case studies in the book from Cheesecake Factory to Double Tree Hotels to a single one location restaurant in you know, Lisbon, Portugal, all of whom are doing these little operational differentiators. And what makes that different from a gimmick, we typically think of gimmicks being kind of a one point in time idea designed to ignite viral word of mouth, social media. And the truth is a lot of talk triggers, if they're done well, can and endure for many, many years. Doubletree Hotel is very famous for 
its chocolate chip cookie. They give to the 75,000 of them out every single day to guests when they check in. And that has been around for uh, almost 30 years, right? So it's something that has endured versus a, a gimmick that they they use as a one-time or sort of an annual stunt. So it's a difference without a distinction, maybe in some cases, but it's actually a very important difference because it changes how you approach the building and sort of activation of that uh, in, a, in a business. Jay, who has done a really great talk trigger that you look looked at and said, man, I wish I would have thought of that. Oh, there's so many. I mean, that's the whole point of the book, right? In talking about this on stages around the world. I think each of us would answer this differently, but my favorite talk trigger probably that I talk about the most often is a restaurant in Sacramento, California called Skip's Kitchen. And Skip's is a very simple proposition. 10 tables, counter service restaurant. You walk to the front counter, you say, I want two patty melts. I want an order of onion rings. I want a chocolate shake. And then they bring your food out to you. Yeah, lots of restaurants do that. Here's what they do though. Again, it's an operational differentiator, as Daniel emphasized. When you order, they whip out from underneath the counter a deck of cards, Park, and they <laughs> fan the cards out <laughs> face down in front of you. And they say, Park, pick a card. And you select a card. And if you get a joker, your entire meal is free, whether you're ordering just for yourself or for eight or 10 other people. Now, Skips has never spent a single penny on advertising in the history of the business. There's a line to get in almost every day. They were just named the 29th best hamburger restaurant in the country by USA Today, despite the fact they've never advertised. And it's because on average, three people win the joker game each day. And when they win, they go crazy, right? They're taking patty melt selfies and they're talking about it on Yelp and TripAdvisor. They're calling their mom. It's a whole hullabaloo, right? So their customers are doing their marketing for them. And that to us is the definition of a successful talk trigger. And it's true. In the best businesses in the world, your customers will propel the business forward if you just give them a consistent story to tell. Now, Skips has a giant neon sign out front. It says Skips Kitchen. Yet, most people in Sacramento call it that Joker restaurant, which tells you all I need to know about the success of their talk trigger. Well, that's awesome. Luis Medina, creative director I work with here, he's just amazing. He was talking about a restaurant out in Scottsdale. And okay, this talk trigger doesn't, I can't recall the name of the restaurant, but I love what they're doing and I got to go out and check it out. He says, every week they post their worst Yelp review up on the big board in the dining room so everybody can see it. And people just love that authenticity of it. And then they said, okay, so we had a problem with this customer. We're going to try to overcome it. So I guess that kind of plays to your Hug Your Haters book and concept, which is also still built around these talk triggers, creating operational excellence. One of the types of talk triggers we talk about, Park, actually, is talkable empathy, right? Which sort of fits into what you're talking about with the restaurant in Scottsdale and almost the hug your haters customer service approach. It's, it's being more empathetic, more warm, more human than customers expect you to be. And, and frankly, that's not a style of word of mouth creation that would have worked maybe three years ago. But now I think it's safe to say we are operating in a uh, climate that has a bit of an empathy deficit. So when you actually are are disproportionately warm and human and kind to your customers, it actually stands out so much so that it becomes talkable, it becomes shareable in a way that it frankly wouldn't have been a, a little while ago because that was the default state and it alas no longer is. And you mentioned in your book that you believe that people are more about trust than truth in this day and age. Do I have that right? I mean, and then how does somebody work that into creating and designing activating talk triggers? I mean, that's a really it's a really interesting thing because we we are living in this this era where the things and the, and the places that people trust are are really their own source of truth and we saw you know in the political landscape with the last elections uh, and you see it play out in a, any number of, of other ways and the whole point is um, in in our research and we we see this been buffered through a lot of other trust and sort of trust research like Edelman other annual trust barometer that the source of truth for a lot of people is their friends and family. The people they know are the ones they trust the most. So a story coming from Skip's Kitchen about you know the, the fact I won a, a free patty melt because I drew the Joker. Well, coming from a friend or a family member, that's a pretty reliable source of information. So uh, because of that trust element, um, it becomes really important to to give you know customers and clients a, a reason, a story, some sort of tale for them to go tell or. You're really relying still on the on the advertising uh, model that we know doesn't work. Yeah, in your book, Talk Triggers, the complete guide to creating customers with word of mouth, folks. By the way, it 
is coming out in early October. But as you are listening to this show this month in August, you can go on to TalkTriggers.com and pre-order. And they've got a whole ton of different packages available to you. But in the book, why I liked it so much is it not only is a fun read with all the anecdotes and stories that you share in there, but you really break down how to do this. Would you guys uh, mind going through what you have as the four types? of talk triggers or the criteria that, that we can get our heads around of, of what a talk trigger is? Yeah, two pieces on that part. One, uh, thank you. And, and I would say, uh, in, in fairness to to the, the great minds that have come before us, I mean, we, we are standing on the shoulders of giants here. There's a number of terrific books about word of mouth and word of mouth marketing that have been published in the last 25 years, uh, many of whom are, are authored by friends of ours or, or professional colleagues. What has been missing in the field of study, in our estimation, however, is a systematic approach for how any business can do it. There's lots of books that chronicle word of mouth, talk about why it's important, examples of it in practice, but there's no system. So we worked really hard to create a system that not only do we know works because we've tested it and we do this kind of consulting uh, with businesses as well, but we've tested it in so many different ways and places that we know that any business can follow it. So what, we're really happy with with that approach. And, and we call it the four, five, six system, the four things that must be true for a differentiator to be a talk trigger, the five different types of talk triggers, and then we have a six-step process for how to build a talk trigger. So it's a four, five, six approach to the book, which makes it very, very easy to to use, even though it's not written as a workbook, it almost functions as a workbook. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So let's start with those four. What are the criteria we need? I guess we can probably go back and forth. So uh, in a a talk trigger, you want it to, to be relevant, right? So it needs to make sense in the context of who you are and what you are. So Doubletree, cookies uh, at the hotels, for example, makes sense because Doubletree's brand positioning is warm welcome. Even within the pantheon of Hilton brands, their approach is warm welcome. So giving you a cookie, also warm, when you walk in fits into that. If, if you walked into a Doubletree hotel and they said, we're going to give you a plate of pasta salad, you're like, I don't know, man, that seems weird, right? So it has to be con- you know, just like a story, right? The story has to make sense. So that's one of them. It, it has to be relevant. The talk trigger has to be reasonable, right? So you don't want it to be too big. And, and this is a tricky proposition because in business now, I'm sure you see this all the time, Park, in your work, in our effort to break through, sometimes we decide to do something really outlandish. And that sometimes backfires, because if it's too big, then customers start to wonder, well, what's the catch here, right? Where's the terms and conditions? What we like to say is experiences that are too grand can actually create suspicion, not conversation. So it's got to be reasonable. So, you know, you see this all the time. People are like, okay, when you're going to win an island or whatever, right? And I'm like, what? I'm not going to, what are you talking about? Like, giving away an island, right? So you don't want to, you, what, we look, what you look for is a Goldilocks zone, right? So big enough to be interesting, small enough to be believable. To that end, your talk trigger must be repeatable. And, and this is where, where our definition of a talk trigger would differ from your example of the symphony promotion. So in the parlance of, of our book and our work, a talk trigger is something that by definition is available to every single customer every single time. It's not surprise and delight, which is what we now call in marketing uh, sort of the one-off promotional ideas. A talk trigger really is an operational difference, not not a marketing campaign. So every single customer at, at Doubletree gets a cookie. Every single patron at Skip's Kitchen gets a chance to pull a joker. It's not on Wednesdays. It's not a customer of the month club. It's not ladies night. It's every single person. So for us, the definition of a talk trigger is something that is repeatable. And then the fourth ingredient, it's four R's in case you haven't picked up on that. Uh, the fourth <laughs> the fourth ingredient, and this is you know sort of by definition, it has to be remarkable. In the true sense, of the definition of that word, which means worthy of remark. Like, I I don't know everybody listening. I definitely know some of the listeners of the show, no question. And obviously I know Park, but the one thing nobody's ever said who's listening to the show, nobody has ever said, hey, let me tell you about this perfectly adequate experience I just had. Right? It just doesn't have, that's not, that's not how stories are told. So if you want your customers to tell a story and you do, that story has to be interesting to the listener. So what you do has to be somewhat remarkable. So those are the four ingredients, remarkable, repeatable, relevant, uh, and whatever the fourth one was that I forgot. <laughs> remarkable, repeatable, reasonable, and relevant. You know, it's funny. I think of both of you just having been around you as marketers first and foremost. So that's what you're cemented in my mind as. And yet I have to actually shift gears a little bit when I'm thinking and reading through talk triggers because it, to your point, it's about operations. It's about doing something remarkable in your operations that then becomes a marketable item, a marketable activity, but you don't necessarily think about that at first. It's just more about how can I make this experience remarkable? Oh, totally. It's been really interesting for us too, right? I mean, being career marketers, I mean, I've been doing this for 
25 years and uh, Daniel almost as long and to say, hey, well, maybe if you just run your business a little differently, the marketing I don't want to say takes care of itself, but make you know becomes a lot easier. It's been a really interesting shift for us too to say, oh, you know, we, we spend so much time in our business, you know, talking to people about how to do better Facebook ads or whatever the flavor of the month is. But at the end of the day, right, if you just do something interesting, your customers will really propel you forward. Uh, and I think, frankly, uh, we've lost sight of that in business. Daniel, you guys came up with the alpaca animal <laughs> icon for your talk trigger. That's all Daniel. So why the alpaca? And of the five different kinds of talk triggers, uh, five types, what does that play to? <laughs> That's a two-part <laughs> question. Um, but the, the, so the alpacas came, came to be because we, we were just in talking about the, the actual physical presence of the book. When you pick up the book, what is the talk trigger for that book going to be? Is it going to be wrapped in, in, in velvet? Uh, I kind of voted for that, but our publisher wasn't such a fan. The So we, we thought maybe we should put animals on the cover, maybe an alpaca. That would be kind of funny. And we so we went down that rabbit hole and and uh, just by pure chance sort of came across this, this uh, body of work of alpacas talking to each other. And we were able to get one of them on the cover. So if you see the cover of the book, it's one alpaca whispering or talking to another alpaca. And that's just sort of how it came to be. I mean, what other business book can you name that has alpacas on the cover of the book that makes it very easy to, to, to spot or point out in a bookstore? So that's kind of the story. Somebody actually has a body of work of photographing alpacas. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole, we, we, we have a whole selection of, so there's like solo alpacas, you know, group alpacas. Uh, we've, we've had a lot of fun bringing, bringing that uh, into kind of into our creative work because uh, it's, it, it does stand out. It, it makes you notice the work a little bit. Oh, it's great fun. And you were talking uh, before we started here about you and Jay are, are going into the recording studio next week to do the audio on this book. And as luck would have it, or the universe shining on you, there happens to be like an alpaca farm next to Jay's place yeah. out there. Yeah, you you may or may not see footage of us together with alpaca. I've never been around an alpaca, so I don't exactly know how they behave. We'll, we'll see uh, how that how that works. That there's, there's I, want, I want a video of both baby. of you whispering yeah, there's, there's into a the alpaca here. that we're going to get to hold for the promotional videos for the book launch, allegedly. So we'll see, we'll see how that goes. Uh, All right. So of your five types of talk triggers, if I'm asking this question right, how does the alpaca play into these? Well, so there, there really are five different, uh, and they're not mutually uh, exclusive categories, but five different types of talk triggers we we uh, identified. One of them is. Uh, responsiveness, uh, you know, speedy response is one way. Uh, another is generosity, people giving things away. Double tree with its cookie, uh, skips with its you know Joker campaign. Uh, sorry, not a campaign. It's it's Joker <clears throat> uh, um, sort of operations. Uh, so th those are two. Uh, a third one is empathy. Jay mentioned this earlier. We are kind of just living in an era right now with a genuine. Sorry about that. Genuine lack of empathy, right? So if you go just a, a little bit above and beyond with empathy, it actually can become a very meaningful talk trigger. So that's that's sort of the fourth. Um, Who's doing a good job with that? You have an example of that? Yeah, there's there's a dentist, a, an oral surgeon actually in New Jersey, Doctor Doctor Glenn Gorab, and uh, just a little fine detail he has in his business. You know, most oral surgeons after you've had surgery will call you and say, "Hey." How you feeling? And that's a nice gesture. Uh, and Glenn thought that's nice, but there are uh, probably a lot of people coming in for surgery who have questions about what the experience will be like. What, is my insurance covered? You know, what kind of pain am I going to have after? And so, what he does every Saturday is calls all of his patients who are coming in the following week to say, "Hey, it's Doctor Gorab. Uh, you're coming in for surgery next week. Do you have any questions? I can answer for you." And it's just a slight pivot in the way he delivers that phone call, but it's perceived as being more empathetic to the patient. Uh, and because of that, he is one of, if not the top oral surgeon in New Jersey, not itself an easy thing to do. It generates a lot of, of positive goodwill for him. People drive out of their way to come see him, as a matter of fact. So empathy, empathy is one of the uh, types of talk. I guess you could consider alpacas and empathy. We, you know, we, we're all creative people in marketing, so... Uh, perhaps you could make the case the alpacas are <laughs> uh, 
an impetus it's trigger. Probably, it's probably the, the fifth one, though, yeah. which is which is talk about attitude, right? And that's where you just do something a little different. Like you would argue maybe that MailChimp is a company that kind of does talk about attitude. Yep. Uh, and, and that's kind of where, where we are with the alpacas is, is sort of the attitude driven uh, talk trigger. But but we have another one in the book as well, Park, that you might be interested in. Um, at the, on the back of the book, there's a big uh, guarantee that says, if you do not love this book entirely, send us an email and Daniel and Jay will buy you any other book of your choosing in the world at any price. I love that. I saw that on your website too, by the way. I thought that was a very nice touch. So you've got this attitude in it, but you've also got empathy worked into that. Yep. That's the idea. Yeah. We're trying to do, yep. trying to do both. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yep. So Daniel, I asked this of Jay, what was, what is one of your favorite talk triggers you've seen in action out there that you wished you had come up with? Well, you know, it is interesting. We just, uh, Jay brought up MailChimp. I, I actually think MailChimp is one of the most brilliant examples of a talk trigger because it's, it's very counterintuitive and it's, it's marketing software. It's not exactly, uh, a free patty melt. But if you if you're familiar with Mailchimp and you, and you know their their chimp that little that cute little monkey you know how pervasive that is in the actual delivery of the product when you're scheduling an email you get a high five from his name is Freddie by the way mm-hmm. he has an actual name so you get a, you know a high five from Freddie Freddie is always rewarding you in the product in addition to being kind of the mascot for Mailchimp they they give him out at at events and conferences so they have done a really good job of for a, 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 a non-physical company, they're a, a virtual company, right? It's, it's it's software of making the product experience part of the talk trigger uh, because Freddie's just so much a big part of it. And, and I would actually argue that is an empathy talk trigger. There is, there is a lot of frustration when you're using uh, uh, CRM software, email software. It's not always easy to do so. Those little those little rewards is kind of the the gaming system. It's the you know gamification of the software. Uh, so I think it's a really interesting example for for those of us who say, well, you know, I'm it's great, but I'm not in the hotel business. I'm not even an oral surgeon. I have a virtual company. I have software that I deliver. I can't possibly have a talk trigger. Uh, it is not true that you can very much have a talk trigger. Yeah, so you see these more in a consumer connection versus a B2B play, I guess. And is it just that uh, the B2B minds out there are so locked in and the logical side of doing business that they don't think about, you know, op- being interesting operationally and doing something like that? Yeah, I, that's some of it. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that, that B2B tends to fall into that fall of the leader trap a little bit more. Also, B2B, I think sometimes feels like if they if they're creative, that somehow trivializes what they sell. But two things on that park. One, word of mouth is manifestly more important in B2B than it is in B2C, ironically. In fact, the, the data show that 91% of B2B purchases are influenced by word of mouth. Nobody buys nothing from another business unless you've checked reviews or talked to somebody who's already a customer. Like you're not going to hire an accountant out of the yellow pages without knowing somebody who actually goes to that account. It's just how we do business now. So, so word of mouth is massively critical for every B2B organization, uh, yet they're perhaps the guiltiest of not paying enough attention to it. But we do have some great examples of, of B2B talk triggers. One, we actually developed at Convince and Convert. Uh, consulting firm that that I run uh, for an organization called Superior Glove. And Superior Glove is a B2B manufacturer of work gloves outside of Toronto, Canada. They make some 300 different types of work gloves. Every conceivable random job, they have a specialized work glove for that. It's it's crazy uh, how specific their their product line is. They compete against some uh, Asian uh, companies who produce work gloves that are less expensive, but also lower quality. So Superior Glove hired us to help them with a talk trigger to emphasize to their customers that their gloves are North American made and higher quality. So we went through the entire talk triggers development process, the exact same process as included in the book. And we concluded that the best possible talk trigger for them, if it was operationally viable, and to their credit, Superior Glove was with us all the way and said, we will make it happen. And today, Park, here's where the talk trigger works. Uh, You've got your pair of superior gloves on. On the back is a little logo. If you scratch that logo and (laughs) smell it, maple syrup 
Scratch and sniff work gloves. Why, why maple syrup? That is an attitude. That is an attitude talk trigger. An attitude talk trigger uh, right there in B2B and well, one that and I'm why very maple proud syrup? to have worked on. Purely because they're, they're from Canada. Canada. Not beer, but maple syrup. We thought about beer, actually, uh, but uh, we thought maple syrup to was a little off. bit easier to uh, And maybe not uh, having to, beer to, on to the, the word right. site is probably a good idea, but I love it. I love it. Yeah, I love good it. point. That, yeah, that is a fantastic yeah. idea. So B two B, we always see it. I mean, even you know, in story and story creation, I am getting more and more calls every day from B two B companies of all sizes of like, oh my god, our people can't communicate. You know, we we, we got to find these stories, and they are so reluctant. I just uh, I imagine they're so reluctant to you know crack open that story shell that they might be even more reluctant to crack open that operational uh, uh, talk trigger shell just because it takes it even deeper. And now they're actually creating stories that, as you say, are re- remarkable and repeatable. Um, what do you have to do, do you feel like, to get through? If you're a, So for instance, we got a listener right now, maybe they're with a big financial planning company and they feel the pain. They're trying to get this through in their organization. What do you do or how do you go about coaching them to at least getting their people open to finding these operational excellent moments that lead into phenomenal brand storytelling? Well, one of the interesting things, uh, we, we have this structure uh, that we we put together in the book because we, in learning from a lot of the case studies, how they have how they came up with and sort of brought their talk triggers to life in their company we we came up with this this working model we call the triangle of awesome the triangle of awesome has three real components to it uh sales and operations people customer service people and the marketing team and what we found is when when clients had brought that team of people together in the, at the very beginning of a talk triggers process or a word of mouth kind of strategic planning process everything goes w- way better because ultimately what we're talking about is an operational differentiator. So the, the, the operations team has a vested interest in sort of protecting their turf there. Uh, marketing just feels like they should own it because it's sort of marketing related. But with everything uh, what that often overlooks is the customer service team and, and where we learn about <clears throat> these these empathy moments, where we learn about the things that matter to customers. That's that's from the customer service team. That's often the, the front line of the business. So you bring that group of people together and you can just about count on finding champions in those different areas. And those <clears throat> all represent kind of the foxes in the business. Each one of those could shut the idea down at a later point. So if they feel vested in it and invested in it at the beginning, it tends to go much better when you get into it. Have you guys seen um, a talk trigger go bad, go wrong? They tried something and it just blew up. I don't know any that that sort of swung, sort of broke mm-hmm. bad, right? Where where it was like, oh, we, this was just a really uh, not well thought through. But it's it, there's two other circumstances that that can and do happen. One is you launch a talk trigger, and and it gets basically commoditized so quickly that you can't own it. The example we use in the book is Westin Hotels at one point, it was probably seven or eight years ago, Park, you probably remember this, uh, came out with a thing called the Heavenly Bed. And the idea was that, that Westin was going to put all kinds of technology and money into having the most comfortable bed in all of, of hotels. It made a lot of sense. Uh, but then in very short order, Hilton Garden Inn and Marriott and a bunch of other brands were like, hey, man, we've got super special beds too. And so they no longer could hold it as a distinctive talk trigger and they had to abandon that. And now Weston uh, uses as their talk trigger the, the idea where you can spend just $5 and, and you can get uh, sneakers and workout wear uh, anytime you stay there. So they basically supply for you the ability to work out uh, without having to pack your own stuff. That's their That's the talk trigger they move to. The other thing that can happen is that you have a talk trigger and then the world changes around you and it no longer makes sense. So the example that we prefer for that story is is Enterprise Rent-A-Car, who for 20 plus years, their talk trigger was, we'll pick you up. They were the only rental car company that would pick you up. Hertz wouldn't pick you up. Avis wouldn't pick you up. Budget wouldn't pick you up. But Enterprise would pick you up. And that was a really cool and distinctive differentiator until Uber... Because now, why do I need a rental car guy to drop me off when I can press a button on my phone and I can have anybody pick me up or drop me off? It no longer makes any sense, right? So 
they had to uh, move away from that because it no longer made sense in the context of the world in which we live. Mm-hmm. I mean, we looked at we uh, we had that thesis, so we actually st- we did a, a secondary study on on what enterprise customers talk about, and the 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 car pickup service certainly wasn't first. It wasn't even third or fourth or fifth. It was seventh, right. number seven after. After customer service problems, you know, dirty cars, smell, you, know, the, you can definitely see sort of the the declining return for their talk trigger just played out in the data. Right when, when the tagline of all your TV commercials for 20 years is we'll pick you up and then it's number seven in social chatter, yeah. it's clearly Time no longer on. resonating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I was yep. watching, have you seen this new show? Well, it's not new. I guess it's three seasons in. It's new to me called Shit's Creek. It's written. Uh, it's on Netflix. Uh, written by Eugene Levy and his son Daniel Levy, and it is. Yeah, dude, that is the funniest show on on uh, available on Netflix right now. I, think. I don't know it. I'm oh, pausing the it show. I'm going to go really, download it right like this second. Twenty yeah. minute episodes, and it's you know kind of the um, the the players from SCTV. It's Canadian done. It's done in Canada. Mm. Uh, a lot of Canadian. Chris Elliott is on nice. it. I, if you remember Chris Elliott. He is brilliant. Oh, he man. plays Chris the Elliott. mayor of Schitt's Creek. But anyway, um, earlier this month, thank you, gentlemen, by the way, for both of you contributing to the Business of Story Online magazine. It's all about customer journeying and how do you make those remarkable moments for people. And I appreciate both your articles. But Daniel, when I read yours, which was an excerpt from the Talk Triggers book, you were talking about the Cheesecake Factory. And why I thought it was so funny is literally mm-hmm. when I read your um, article for the first time was the very first night I watched the episode, the first episode of Shit's Creek. And in it, they have that cafe <laughs> with those ridiculously large menus. And I just thought, how weird is this that I would, I would get that out of your, <laughs> your reading, but um, a wonderful uh, 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 sitcom. And I was thinking too, it's talk trigger was one of, was the big menu because the people that referred it to us said, not only is it funny, but you got to see these huge menus. It's just ridiculous in every scene when they're sitting down at the cafe. So that of course is my long way of coming around to your article, what Cheesecake Factory did in a very operational way to create a talk trigger. Well, they've, they've been doing it since the first day, right? And, and the Cheesecake Factory menu is, is truly gigantic. Uh, I had my intern permanently borrow a Cheesecake Factory menu. Uh, One of the many reasons I'm looking for another intern. And I had her count the words and the Cheesecake Factory menu is 5,940 words long. Now, the book that we just finished is like 53,000 words, right? So the Cheesecake Factory menu is like 15% of a business book or whatever, which is a lot. Uh, and, and I think another way to put it, Park, is that the Cheesecake Factory makes chicken 85 different ways. Now, if we ask listeners of this podcast to, to you know, participate in a contest and write down, without going to Google, write down all the different ways that you can make chicken, nobody can get to 20. They make 85 different kinds of chicken. They'll make they'll make chicken out of anything. Just random ingredients plus chicken equals a dish in the menu. That's right. It, it works perfectly. So, uh, and what's hilarious about it is if you look on on uh, on you know Yelp, TripAdvisor, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, you, you'll see all these funny tweets about the Cheesecake Factory menu. My my favorite one is guy said we're reading the Cheesecake Factory menu at my book club, which I think is pretty which I think is pretty hilarious. Uh, and and it, it really is their talk trigger. Now you might think, okay, yeah, it's a big menu, but you know that's not that doesn't propel their business. Well, here's the thing. Cheesecake Factory, uh, according to our research, spends five times, not 5%, 5x less on advertising than any other chain in their competitive set. They spend almost nothing on advertising because their customers do their advertising for them. So Daniel and I talked to a thousand Cheesecake Factory customers and found that 38% of them without being asked, have mentioned the size of the menu to somebody else in the prior 60 days. So this talk trigger, this operational choice, and it is definitely a choice to have a 6,000 word menu. This operational choice is part of what 
creates the success equation for the and business. They spend five times in printing costs for their uh, menu, but that's about it. <laughs> yeah, good for you. Yeah, they make it. They make up for it in <laughs> lamination. Can you imagine being a server, like being a server at Cheesecake Factory? Hey, you guys ready to order? No, nah, man, we're not ready yet. We're, we're, we're noticed, still not ready. Though, the server's <laughs> like, right arm and body is larger than their left arm because they come out with the. That's with right. The that's menus. it. <laughs> Holding my, the menu. My favorite yes. tweet that you have in your book is this one from Greg Mania. You know, what book do you want to see made into a movie? I want to see the Cheesecake Factory menu made into a movie. Yeah. <laughs> so many good ones. Uh, one of my yeah. favorite ones, it's not in the book, it's one we've discovered since, was my daughter said her English class requires 1,000 pages of summer reading. So we went to the Cheesecake Factory and I handed her a menu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's beautiful stuff. And here we are talking about it, you know, around the world. Yeah. And what's, what's yeah. crazy about it, though, is the Cheesecake Factory, the name of it is the Cheesecake Factory, not the giant menu factory. And yet, you know, the cheesecake is certainly one of their talk triggers, but. Yeah. And there's a lot of them. There's like 30, last time I checked, I think it's 32 different mm -hmm. types of cheesecake, which in and of itself is hard to believe. Um, you know, that that's. That's you know, I was sitting here thinking and was hoping that you guys weren't going to ask me what is my favorite talk trigger that I wished I had come up with. Turn that question on me because as I was scouring my mind, I can't really think of one. Maybe I'm not as in tune to them as you guys are in writing the book, but I just don't see them that often. So there is like this enormous opportunity. Yeah, I mean, if we well, I mean, there's two things to that. You're right. I mean, one, once you're kind of once you sort of immerse yourself in the in in this concept, you start to see them more for sure. But the other one is you don't see them that often, which is why we needed to write a book about it, right? If everybody was doing this, it'd be a pretty useless book. So that's why we're so excited about this premise. It's like, look, I we know this will work for businesses of all types and sizes. But yet we still have this blue ocean opportunity, the same way we have with storytelling, frankly, that, that people just have not fully awoken to the fact that word of mouth has been around since the first caveman sold a rock to another caveman. But yet we've taken it for granted this whole time. What every single business does is they tell themselves a lie. And the lie is that competency creates conversation. If you're just a good business, your customers will talk about you. But that's not true. Nobody talks about good. They talk about different. They talk about remarkable. So we, we, and not to mention the fact every business is good, right? It's not, you know, if you're going to say we're going to have good food and that's our secret, your food better be awfully good in, in a way that, that frankly, most businesses can't sustain. Yeah. Well, when, when we do our brand story um, development, I'll ask our clients come up with nine one word descriptors, three about the company itself, three about your offering and three about your customer service. And invariably, yep. one of them is going to be quality. And I go, yeah. no, you can't own quality. Can't have that, that's the cost of entry. You got to have quality. So let's just move yeah. on from that. But it's the same type of thing. I mean, um, you know, you're talking about the caveman who bought the rock. I just did my 23 and Me, and I got my findings back. And given some of my recent purchases, I think I was related to the guy buying the rock. <laughs> <laughs> that made me think. So. Do you have to be extraordinarily creative to come up with this? I mean, the, I guess really my last question for you guys here, the listeners sitting around saying, okay, that's all well and good. And I just don't know if I have it in me to find just that perfect talk trigger. How can no, the regular I, cave I man or woman out there find that? No, I don't, I don't think it is. I mean, look at, look at, like Daniel said, look at Glenn Gorab, right? He's a dentist who places five phone calls every Saturday. There's no creativity in that. I mean, not really. It's, I mean, certainly, you know, some measure of creativity can help. And some of the talk triggers are, are interesting because they're dynamic or different or interesting. But the real key to this is actually understanding your customers and what they expect. So the process that we un unveil in the book really focuses on mapping the entire customer journey and then interviewing customers and figuring out what they expect from you at each of those touch points and then finding a way at one of those touch points to do something that they totally do not expect. The problem part is not creativity. The problem is that most business owners today do not actually understand their customers well enough and certainly do not understand what their customers expect of them enough. You know, there's a, there's a famous saying that you, you can't read the label of the jar that you're in. And that what that's what holds people back from being able to do this is is just not having that outside perspective. They just get too close to it. Um, there's a lot of great talk triggers that businesses have that they don't turn into a talk trigger because they don't think it's interesting. Yeah, they're just so close to their business and not to their customers that they can't see it. And it sounds like then it comes back to really more common sense and 
what do you find fun and interesting and different that if you do, and if you really understand your customers, the chances are you can connect that curiosity and passion with them through an interesting type of talk, talk trigger. There's a guy who runs a tire company, just, you know, tire, tire mm-hmm. pros franchise in uh, Kansas. And he's been the local tire guy in a small town forever. His talk trigger, and he didn't know it was a talk trigger until I told him, but his talk trigger is once he finishes uh, work on your tires, he leaves a two liter bottle of locally made root beer on the passenger seat every time. It's just what he does. He just thinks it's cool. He loves root beer and he knows the guy who owns the root beer company. He just thinks it's cool. He's the root beer tire man. Like that doesn't require a ton of, uh, you know, a ton of creativity. It's just, he does it every time. That's just what he does. And now he's known as the root beer tire man. And now he has a talk trigger. So, uh, sometimes you just gotta, uh, you just gotta open yourself up to, to, to just thinking about how customers actually talk. And, and it's funny now that I've been doing this for a while, when I'm out with friends and we're out on the boat or at a restaurant or in an airport, you start to you start to notice how many word of mouth conversations happen. We just talked about the TV show, right? It's it is all around us. And when you start to kind of not think like a business owner, but think like a consumer again, you realize that word of mouth drives everything. But it's all about stories, which is why we're so delighted to be on this fantastic show. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for being here on Business of Story. And again, people can learn more about you guys where. TalkTriggers.com would be the best place to learn about us uh, right now because uh, all kinds of pre-order bonuses, as you mentioned, Park, including including a stuffed alpaca. Wait a second. That's right. That's crazy. Yeah, you. Not not a life-size alpaca because that's a little oh, bit logistically oh, 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 okay. You, but I, still, uh, yeah, still, an actual stuffed alpaca is one of the pre-order bonuses. Uh, and also a ton, and I mean a ton, I'm not just like saying this, a ton of stuff that's not in the book, including a discussion guide, an actual keynote presentation, all the charts and graphs in the book, supplemental research called Chatter Matters. There's a, you know hundreds of pages of other stuff that aren't in the book that you get for free if you go to talktriggers.com. That is awesome. And do we get the bonus photo collection of that person's body of work of alpacas talking to each other? As a matter of, as a matter of fact, there's some of those for sure. Daniel has had uh, a great deal of fun uh, using alpacas as the uh, supporting art for all things related to this book. <laughs> <laughs> well, gentlemen, thank you so much for being here on Business of Story. And again, people can learn more about you guys where? TalkTriggers.com would be the best place to learn about us uh, right now because uh, all kinds of pre-order bonuses, as you mentioned, Park, including including a stuffed alpaca. Wait a second. That's right. That's crazy. Yeah, you. Not not a life-size alpaca because that's a little bit oh, logistically oh, oh, tricky. Oh, oh, okay. But still, I, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, still, an actual stuffed alpaca is one of the pre-order bonuses. Uh, and also a ton, and I mean a ton, I'm not just like saying this, a ton of stuff that's not in the book, including a discussion guide, an actual keynote presentation, all the charts and graphs in the book, supplemental research called Chatter Matters. There's a, you know hundreds of pages of other stuff that aren't in the book that you get for free if you go to talktriggers.com. That is awesome. And do we get the bonus photo collection of that person's body of work of alpacas talking to each other? As a matter, we'll of, as a matter of fact, there's some of those for sure. Daniel has had uh, a great deal of fun uh, using alpacas as the uh, supporting art for all things related to this book. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, guys, thank you so much for being here. I know you're busy. I'll let you roll. And I want to thank all of you for listening to this edition of The Business of Story. I've been through the book. Definitely get it when it comes out in October. If you want to get a little glimpse of it, visit TalkTriggers.com or go to our online magazine, the August issue of The Business of Story. Until next week when we will have another marvelous story artist here at Business of Story, I want you to remember that the most potent story you will ever tell is the story you tell yourself. So make it a great one. Thanks for listening.